Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to our uh, September OXOC talk. Um, we are very happy to have Eric Fisher. Uh, he's our speaker tonight. And uh, Eric is a research scientist at the Institute of Human Origins at Arizona State University, an honorary researcher at the Evolutionary Studies Institute at the University of the Witwatersrand, and an associate member of the Center for Coastal Paleosciences at Nelson Mandela University. Uh, he is interested in the origins of modern humans and archaeoinformatics, which leverages the integrative framework of digital technologies to build intrinsically interdisciplinary studies of complex archaeological problems. Eric has field experience across the Horn of Africa, East Africa, South Africa, Arabia, and Mesoamerica. Eric has worked in South Africa since 2008, spending a lot of time working at the caves of Pinnacle Point, near Mossel Bay before moving east to begin the P5 project in the Eastern Cape. His talk this evening is the coastal occupation and foraging during the last glacial maximum and early Holocene at Waterfall Bluff, Eastern Pono land in South Africa. And the, uh, the, the little bit more about the talk is, I uh, hope some of you read about it, is that archeological evidence shows that coastlines have been a key resource for hunter gatherers for tens of thousands of years and for good reason. Coastlines often provided predictable, diverse, and abundant foods and other resources that supported day-to-day -day life. Yet existing records of coastal foraging during the Pleistocene in Africa are biased almost entirely towards interglacial periods, hampering long-term perspectives on when and how these places were utilized and our understanding of any long-term impacts that coastal resources may have had on the biological or cultural evolution of humans. Recent findings from, from the site of Waterfall Bluff in eastern Ponolan in the Eastern Cape have documented well-preserved stratigraphy, faunal and botanic remains alongside abundant stone artifacts and other materials, providing a detailed record of hunter-gatherer occupations from the late Pleistocene to the Holocene that includes the last spatial maximum and transition from the Pleistocene to the Holocene. These excavations have also documented the first direct evidence of coastal foraging in Africa during a glacial maximum, and across a glacial interglacial transition. The presence of both marine fish and shellfish in these records demonstrates that Pleistocene hunter gatherers targeted different but specific coastal ecological niches, all the, way, all the while collecting terrestrial resources from throughout the broader landscape and maintaining links to highland locales inland. Research at Waterfall Bluff therefore provides a complementary perspective on hunter gatherer behavioral responses to environmental shifts that is often biased towards groups living in marginal environments where resource availability and predictability were already low. So without further ado, and thank you to all of those who waited a couple of little minutes to, uh, for us to start, I'm going to hand over to Eric to take us through his talk. Okay, all yours. Thank you so much, Nick, and good evening, and thank you all for inviting me to give this presentation. What's that? No, all all Are good. We ready, you, Nick? Can, you can go ahead. Yep, yep, you go ahead. Oh, oh sorry, I just, um, all of a sudden, it, uh, okay, okay, great, thank you. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to be here today and tonight for many of you in, in South Africa. And it's a pleasure to be able to speak to this society today. Its outreach and publications have long been excellent resources for not only archaeological education, but inf information for researchers like myself. And in fact, one of the earliest publications by the P5 project was in the Digging Stick, uh, where we provided an overview about our work in Pondoland at the time and many of the different research and outreach activities that we were doing. And today, I'm gonna be giving you an updated review of our research in Pondoland. Now, I'm gonna frame this discussion around the question that kicked off P5 research over a decade ago. And that question, is how did hunter-gatherers behave in coastal contexts during the Pleistocene? Many of you might be familiar with the Pleistocene. It's the geological period of time that preceded the period we are in now, known as the Holocene, which began around 12,000 years ago. The Pleistocene, though, 
was characterized not only by repeated glacial and interglacial periods, but also by the biological and behavioral evolution of Homo sapiens. Thereafter, I will walk you through many of the main issues that we face when testing this question, such as how hunter-gatherers respond to changes in their environments, but also the absence of coastal foraging records in southern Africa that span glacial and interglacial periods. And then I will talk about how my team is filling in these gaps in our study area in the Eastern Cape and why our sites in Pondoland, including Waterfall Bluff, preserve this unique window to hunter-gather behavioral uh, behavior in coastal environments. Thereafter, I have some very exciting new results to share with you before I conclude this talk with a brief discussion about where are researchers headed in the future, because of course the end of one research question is always the beginning for a half dozen new questions. So in 2007, I was working with my friend and colleague, Dr. Curtis Marion and his SACB4 team on the south coast near Mosel Bay. At cave PP13B, we had discovered the earliest evidence of people systematically collecting marine resources, dating around 167,000 years ago. As part of that study, I built the geospatial model of coastline changes over time to show that the timing of those marine foraging records during a glacial period coincided with the brief pulse in sea levels that brought the coastline up and within foraging distance of Pinnacle Point. During the last 200,000 years, the Earth has undergone repeated changes in climates between glacial phases, when more oceanic water is trapped in polar ice caps, leading to drops in global sea level, and interglacial phases, when the ice caps melt, resulting in higher global sea levels. Southern Africa mostly has a very broad and flat continental shelf, meaning that drops in sea levels during glacial periods translated into major changes of the shoreline, ultimately exposing as much as 80,000 square kilometers of seafloor during glacial periods. That's approximately the size of the island of Ireland today. That exposed landmass is believed to have provided a significant range expansion for grassland habitats and grazing taxa on places like the Paleogolus Plain making it a very attractive place to hunter-gatherers. However, when coastal sites like Pinnacle Point or Blombus or Clases and so many others became inland sites during these glacial times, hunter-gatherers seeking coastal resources had to move out furthest to remain within daily foraging range of that coast. The large gaps we now find in coastal foraging records are, therefore, due largely to rising sea levels during interglacial periods, sweeping across the exposed continental shelf and destroying the evidence of glacial human occupations in those areas. In fact, based on my calculations, up to 55% of the last 200,000 years of coastal foraging history may be lost to rising sea level changes. And so in 2010, I set out to find any remaining records of glacial coastal foraging. From my geospatial modeling results, I hypothesized that places with narrow continental shelves had the potential to preserve long-term records of coastal occupation and foraging because these narrow shelves would have limited past coastline movements across both glacial and interglacial periods. Working closely with my friend and colleague, Dr. Haley Cothra, we studied the onshore and offshore geology of South Africa, and we quickly focused on Pondoland in the Eastern Cape province. Pondoland has a very narrow continental shelf that capped coastline movements during glacial periods to just eight kilometers from the modern coast. The ship seen in this image, for example, was observed from our coastal site at Waterfall Bluff following the continental shelf break, and it was clearly visible to the naked eye. This means that past hunter-gatherers living on today's coastline would have always had access to coastal resources during both glacial and interglacial phases, and those archaeological resources would have been less likely to have been destroyed by sea level rise. 
isolated exposures of MC Caba formation sandstones have also enabled the formation of coastal and near coastal rock shelters. The vegetation is also diverse, with a mosaic of sourfelt grasslands, bushfelt, and forests. These tightly packed, endemic, and ancient vegetation zones each provide their own plant and animal resources that support people today and likely also would have supported people in the past. Offshore, the warm water Agullis current influences marine habitats by stabilizing the inshore water temperature, which supports intertidal shellfish and littoral fish communities. The Agullis current also drives the convection of moist coastal air cells for coastal precipitation. In fact, incisions on the submerged continental shelf that are being mapped by a Halicothra indicate that there was enough precipitation during the glacial periods to support Paleo rivers, which would have been a key source of fresh water to resident hunter-gatherers. So, the P5, began, P5 project began in earnest in 2010 as an outgrowth of the SAC P4 project and its related Paleoscapes project. P5 is currently based at Arizona State University, but in 2016, I divested sole leadership of the project among myself, Dr. René Esteban, Dr. Haley Cothra, and Dr. Justin Pargeter. René, Justin, and Haley have been with the project since the beginning, and by 2016, they had all received their PhDs. Between the four of us, the project leadership is now equally represented between female and male researchers, and between South African and foreign researchers like myself. This demographic extends to our entire and inter international and interdisciplinary research team, which now includes over 20 individuals, of which over half are South African or based at South African universities or institutions. We also now cover travel and living expenses for black South African students on our project who may lack the financial resources to attend specialized training like fieldwork. In 2019, for example, all but two students in our field season were African, with representation from Cameroon, Lesotho, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. From the outset, our project has also worked closely with traditional Amapondo leaders and communities to build trust and show our respect for the local people, their beliefs and knowledge systems. Our community-wide engagement in Pondoland has ranged from community presentations and research strategy planning with the tradi traditional leadership in Isinkosa, Afrikaans, and English. We have also helped to maintain local services by supporting a local community center, and we also run an indigenous cultural heritage training program since 2016 that trains local Amapondo residents in archaeological science. And even though the research is shut, down, uh, is shut down during these COVID times, we still maintain as active of a presence in the area as possible. In fact, Dr. Esteban is currently in Pondoland right now as an ambassador for the project, arriving nearly as soon as those travel restrictions were lifted. I also want to emphasize how heavily supported our research infrastructure is by the East London Museum, which houses the P5 laboratory. They have generously provided a large and secure space to store our collections, conduct research, and maintain our equipment, which includes a mobile tented camp to work in the remote location. It's given us a base of operations, and in the future, we hope the East London Museum will be a home to other projects in the region too, and a new hub of archeological research supporting the tremendous and long-standing efforts of the Albany Museum, the Eastern Cape Provincial Heritage Resources Authority, and Sahra at the national level. Our initial 2011 survey documented over two dozen open air and rock shelter archeological sites within the Imkambati, Msikaba, and Lambazi areas of Eastern Pondoland. These sites dated from the Middle Pleistocene, Early Stone Age, all the way to historic European colonialism. Our oldest site 
is located in the Mkambati Nature Reserve at the Imsikaba River mouth. It's a coastal dune with stratified paleosols. Those are ancient land surfaces. Our optically stimulated luminescence ages show that these paleosols range in age from 300,000 years ago to around 130,000 years ago. Early Stone Age large cutting tools are found in abundance across the site, indicating some landscape deflation. But importantly, at the very top of the sequence, there is also a preserved Middle Stone Age occupation surface, complete with refitting artifacts that is at least 130,000 years old. Today, though, I'm going to focus on our research at the site of Waterfall Bluff, which is a coastal rock shelter in the Lombazi district of eastern Pondoland that has revealed archaeological deposits that span the late Pleistocene to the Holocene and includes the end of marine isotope stage 3, the last glacial maximum, the last glacial interglacial transition, the early Holocene, and the middle Holocene. The last glacial maximum is the period of maximum ice sheet expansion during the last ice age, dating from around 26,500 years ago to around 19,000 years ago. Sea levels were nearly 130 meters lower today, which is about 400 feet for the Americans in the audience, leading to widespread exposure of the continental shelves worldwide, including the exposure of Sundaland and Sahul in Southeast Asia. In South Africa, the exposed continental shelf was greatest at the Agulhas Bank, and it was generally much cooler, though not necessarily drier, in all places. During this time, records of coastal foraging cease. Scant evidence for coastal foraging does not reappear until around 15,000 years ago, and really only appears in abundance after about 13,000 years ago with the onset of the Holocene. The disappearance and reappearance of coastal foraging in the archaeological record can be directly tied to coastline distance from lower sea levels during the last glacial maximum, making this time period an ideal proof of concept to test my hypothesis. If evidence of LGM coastal foraging existed in Pondoland, then it was likely that earlier records could also be preserved. The LGM is also recent enough that multiple dating methods can be used, including radiocarbon. But there are other interesting things about the LGM to consider too. Nick, I need to stop real quick here. Do you hear me okay? I'm getting significant feedback. Now it, it's gone. All right. I just, it, there is this very loud sound and, and I was worried that no one else could hear me. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So the archeological records dating to the LGM, which are already rare, suggest widespread movements of people during this time. For example, by 29,000 years ago, sites in the Western Lesotho lowlands are abandoned and they're not reoccupied until the very end of the LGM, around 20,000 years ago. The situation is similar in the eastern Lesotho highlands, where occupation persists until 23,000 years ago, when the sites are abandoned, until about 15,000 years ago, which is after the LGM. Lower elevations see similar population movements in the eastern Cape Midlands, between the coast and the Molotti Drakensberg highlands. Occupations end by 25,000 years ago, and they don't resume again until around 13,000 years ago. To the northeast, near the KwaZulu-Natal coast, the site of Umschlatazana is abandoned by 30,000 years ago and only sees brief pulses of occupation at 14,000 years ago and around 10,000 years ago. Clearly, people are moving around but where did they go? Clues may be found in the Moloti-Drakensberg Highlands, 
At the site of Sohong Hong, a vervet monkey scapula and marine tick shell beads have been discovered in deposits dating just before the site and the highlands themselves were abandoned 23,000 years ago. Vervet monkeys are a tropical lowland species, suggesting that either live vervet monkeys or pieces thereof were brought from the lowlands to the highlands, like the marine shell beads. Interestingly, when people reoccupy Sahong Hong after the LGM, they brought more shell beads from the Indian Ocean coast with them, plus more vervet monkeys, or pieces thereof. This suggests a link between highland and lowland hunter-gatherer groups, perhaps via trade in goods or ideas, but perhaps also of the people themselves. So, where did they go? Before now, a coastal LGM record did not exist. Our work at Waterfall Bluff changes that, and it shows us for the first time that unlike the interior, the coast was occupied repeatedly and persistently from over 30,000 years ago to 11,000 years ago, spanning the entirety of the last glacial maximum and the turnover from the Pleistocene to the Holocene. Waterfall Bluff is a large, dry coastal rock shelter on a cliff face adjacent to the waterfall at the Mlubumkulu River into the Indian Ocean. The shelter is 80 meters long and it's located 24 meters above sea level, protecting the archaeological deposits from sea level fluctuations and storm surges. Since 2015, we have excavated in two areas of the site. The eastern excavations have revealed a sequence of shell-rich sediments with deposits that we have dated to the Middle Holocene, approximately 8,000 years ago. The bulk of our excavations, though, have occurred on the west side of the site. There, we have excavated a four and a half meter long trench, which starts at the drip line and goes into the shelter. Our excavations at the site also rely on renewable and clean energy from a portable windmill that powers our lights, computers, and other equipment. We also use global navigation satellite systems and total station mapping, combined with photogrammetric models derived from unmanned aerial vehicle surveys of the shelter floor and cliff face to link the site with the surrounding landscape. These models provide a multi-scalar perspective of the landscape surrounding the site through to granular observations of our stratigraphic profiles visible in our high-resolution, color-calibrated photo mosaics of the stratigraphic walls within the excavations. Additionally, we plot all sediment samples collected from every stratigraphic layer that we excavate for plant pollen, plant phytoliths, and leaf wax analysis, besides geochemistry and magne magnetic mineralogy and other specialized analyses. We also plot all archaeological remains, fauna, stratigraphic surfaces, and samples in 3D using our total stations. These 3D data are a key resource when interpreting the stratigraphy and understanding site formation processes and how people used the site through time. Our excavations have revealed a complex stratigraphic sequence with two main sedimentological units that we call the light brown coarse sands, or LBCS, and the shell-rich clay sands, or SRCS. In general, preservation of shell and stratigraphic features is poor at the drip line, but it increases quickly into the rock shelter. We've used a multi-proxy dating approach at Waterfall Bluff to independently test the chronologies and identify factors that may be influencing our results. For example, our single grain optically stimulated luminescence ages were calculated by Rosaria Saktura and her PhD advisor, Dr. Zenobia Jacobs at the University of Wollongong. These ages show that our oldest currently excavated deposits at Waterfall Bluff 
date to around 37,000 years ago during marine isotope stage 3. The overlying samples date to the last glacial maximum and last glacial interglacial transition. But more recently, we have collaborated with Dr. Stefan Finkler at South Africa's Itemba Labs to create one of the most comprehensive radiocarbon chronologies for the late Pleistocene in southern Africa. This sequence is composed of 51 AMS radiocarbon dates on charcoal that we collected in multiple vertical transects systematically sampling each stratigraphic layer. We have incorporated or calibrated ages into a Bayesian chronological model seen here at left. The results of this model complement our OSL chronology and when considered alongside the resolution of the archaeological deposits and the dating methods, it suggests a persistent occupation of Waterfall Bluff from marine isotope stage 3 through to the early Holocene, importantly including the last glacial maximum and the last glacial interglacial transition. Multi-proxy evidence of coastal foraging in the form of marine fish remains and shellfish are found throughout the excavated sequence including from deposits dated to marine isotope stage 3, the last glacial maximum, the last glacial interglacial transition, the early Holocene, and the middle Holocene. Importantly, these records provide a window into hunter-gatherer behavior across a glacial interglacial phase in a persistent coastal context, which has never before been studied. Preservation of the fish remains overall is excellent, with many fragile features preserved. Burning is also evident on some of the bone. To date, we have identified over 1,600 pieces of marine fish bone. Overall, the taxa are re representative of species common today in estuarine environments. The shellfish are predominantly brown mussel, the smaller quantities of limpets, and a few natal rock oysters all of which are common on rocky shorelines today. And in total, there are about 17 identified marine invertebrate taxa in the assemblage. We have also discovered a variety of shaped bone tools. Interestingly, box A, seen here in the upper left, is one half of a broken biconical implement with notching at the midpoint that would have been around the middle of that object. It's sized and shaped similarly like fishing gorges that have been found at other sites in South Africa. There are other numerous perforated shell ornaments, though most of them come from the SRCS, which dates from the last glacial interglacial transition and early Holocene. These beads include multiple tick shell beads as well as perforated mussel shell. Interestingly, we have also found a single ostrich eggshell bead in our early Holocene deposits, which you can see here in the upper left-hand corner. Ostriches are historically unknown at the coast and are mainly located in the drier, short grass plains of the Midlands around the Molotie Drakensberg Highlands, as seen in this image showing the modern distribution of ostriches. Whereas the beads and vervet bits at Sahong Hong suggest a coast to uplands link. This ostrich eggshell bead implies an uplands to coast link of either goods, people, or both. We have also begun to analyze our lithic sequence and have preliminarily and have preliminary results based on a sample of over 400 pieces from LBCS and SRCS. The LBCS assemblage is miniaturized in character, with a clear emphasis on the production of smaller, more elongated kinds of flakes. In contrast, the SRCS assemblage emphasizes wider side struck flakes, with a distinct large flaked and retouched component alongside a miniaturized subassemblage comprising small utilized and retouched flakes. Differences between the LBCS and SRCS include the location where raw materials seem to have been procured. For example, it seems the SRCS stone may have been predominantly uh, taken from rivers and the coast, 
compared to more terrestrial resources in the LBCS. And we have also not yet found any groundstone in the older LBCS layers. Interestingly, multiple artifacts across the entire sequence were manufactured on small water-worn pebbles seen here circled in orange. These pebbles, we think, were transported to the site in the byssus of shellfish. That's at the bottom of the shellfish is what binds them to rocks, suggesting that this byproduct of coastal food foraging likely also served as a raw material source for tool makers. Waterfall Bluff is also notable for having excellent plant preservation. This preservation includes whole leaves, grasses, and other macrobotanic tissues seen here. And we now have a robust multi-proxy archaeobotanic team leading studies of plant pollen, silicified plant remains like phytoliths, charred wood, preserved plant tissues, plant starches, and leaf wax isotopes. We are also linking these studies to modern day plant use via ethnobotanical studies of medicinal and food plants, as well as wood fuel. The results that I will share with you today summarize recent results from the analysis of 33 tri tri tripartite plant pollen, phytolith, and leaf sample wax samples spanning our marine isotope stage three, last glacial maximum, last glacial interglacial transition, and early Holocene deposits. We have also analyzed 46 macrobotanic plant fragments and 43 charcoal fragments from similar layers. The preserved plant tissues are from dicot plants. However, right now, little more can be said of them because most of the specimens that we recovered in 2016 were unexpected and they deteriorated soon after discovery. Since then, we've implemented many new protocols for plant tissue preservation, and these new specimens are sitting in our lab, nicely preserved, but all alone and unstudied because COVID has shut everything down, including all of our lab and field work, of course. We've also analyzed 27 fragments of charcoal, which were identified to species level. Overall, these taxa show that hunter-gatherers at Waterfall Bluff we're collecting hardwoods, which are good for burning, but also spe species that have edible and medicinal value too. In fact, in the SRCS deposits, we have also detected an extremely high concentration of pollen belonging to Artemisia afra. The concentration appears to be too high to be windblown, and we hypothesize that it may be from bringing this plant directly onto the site. Today, Artemisia afra is one of the most widely used medicinal plants in South Africa, with treatments for tuberculosis, malaria, and numerous other illnesses, and it also helps to prevent inf insect infestations. Another interesting finding is that tree species known to coastal forests were being collected from marine isotope stage three through to the Holocene, importantly including during the LGM. It's yet another link between the inhabitants at Waterfall Bluff and the coast during the glacial maximum, when the coastline was maximally eight kilometers from the site. In fact, today it's not uncommon for women collecting shellfish at the coast to also collect fuel wood for fires during those same foraging trips. The paleoenvironmental data indicate that during marine isotope stage three and the last glacial maximum, there was low precipitation in the area and low rainfall seasonality under generally cool conditions. The landscape would have been characterized by open woodlands interspersed with dry and hygrophilous grasslands and bushveld vegetation where there was also very good representation of Feinbos elements. These vegetation patterns would have existed alongside Afro-temperate forests, which were also present and likely occurred along river valleys and scarps, possibly 
also including the exposed continental shelf towards the south and west of Waterfall Bluff. And forests in those areas would have been supported by the Paleo rivers and the cool temperatures, which would have favored low evapotranspiration. Post-glacial forests, though, contracted significantly, but they did not ever disappear entirely. And that contraction is possibly as a result of marine transgressions and a reduction in westerly winds. During the early Holocene, though, the paleoenvironmental signal points to higher rainfall and higher summer seasonality. These changes are coeval with an increase of coastal forest taxa and C4 mesic grasslands with localized wetland vegetation around Waterfall Bluff. So, where does that leave us? Our research so far indicates that at Waterfall Bluff, groups of hunter-gatherers occupied the site during both interglacial and glacial periods, when Afro-temperate forests, grasslands, and bushveld existed alongside freshwater rivers that created estuarine environments at the coast. That coast stayed within eight kilometers of the site even during the LGM, and people exploited it, as evidenced by marine fish and shellfish remains, as well as the charcoal of tree species from coastal forests. But how might Waterfall Bluff and the people who used the site have been part of larger region-wide movements of people during the late Pleistocene? Let's review some of the evidence. First, just before Sahong Hong was abandoned during the early last glacial maximum, the archaeological records there in the Lesotho Highlands indicate hunter-gatherers had brought with them marine shell beads, as well as vervet monkeys, or pieces thereof. These taxa are found in the lowlands at or nearby the Indian Ocean coast. Thereafter, the Maloti Drakensberg Highlands and the Midlands to the south and east are abandoned for a period of several thousand years. And when the highlands are reoccupied, those hunter-gatherers brought with them marine shell beads from the Indian Ocean coast. At the same time, hunter-gatherers at Waterfall Bluff had ostrich eggshell beads. The nearest likely location of ostriches at this time was probably the short grass plains of the interior midlands to the west of Waterfall Bluff. Were the people moving, or just goods and ideas? We think it was probably the former, considering especially that the signal of human occupation during the last glacial maximum is lost in so many places, except for Waterfall Bluff. And there is also evidence of bi-directional movement in ostrich eggshell beads at the coast and marine beads in the highlands. So, how do we begin to test the hypothesis of links between coastal and highland populations? The first place that we have started is by developing a multi-isotopic mapping approach across the region. The example you see here shows a map of bioavailable strontium isotopes from the south coast, which Sandy Copeland, Petrus LaRue, Haley Cothra, and I developed for the SAC-P4 project in 2016. That same team is updating and applying the isoscape approach around Pondoland, and we have already begun to collect and analyze samples, with the goal being to characterize the region from the coast all the way to the highlands. We will be able to compare isotopic results from the serial sampling of animal teeth found in the archaeological excavations at Waterfall Bluff to understand where hunter-gatherers were hunting, for example, if it was at the coast or inland. We also intend to analyze the isotopes of the Waterfall Bluff ostrich eggshell bead and source the provenience of that shell. Interestingly, the phylogeography of vervet monkeys also shows distinct populations to the west and east of the Moloti Drakensberg Highlands. Therefore, we're also currently applying for funding to attempt the recovery and analysis of ancient DNA from the Sahong Hong vervet monkey scapula, potentially to source 
its population. While each of these data sets potentially builds a stronger case for links between highland and coastal lowland population, none really directly tests the people themselves. So that's why we're also planning on applying for permits to analyze our LGM human teeth, found in layer LBCS Haley that has a modeled age range from 28,000 years ago to 24,000 years ago. These teeth could potentially provide direct information about movements of individuals, perhaps even between the coast and the highlands, and provide important information about the diets of hunter-gatherers at the time, particularly seafood-rich diets. And what is so exciting about these teeth is that their context is so well known. Very likely the best for the time period in Africa right now. We have two vertical transects comprising 22 radiocarbon samples, which are built already into our larger Bayesian chronological model that I showed earlier. And it samples every layer below, within, and above both teeth. The teeth themselves are also mapped to melometric accuracy alongside all the other excavated materials within those layers. And we have multiple micromorphological samples waiting to be analyzed to give us granular level details about their stratigraphic contexts. So we have a lot going on right now and lots to look forward to in the future. Unfortunately, like everyone else, we're shut down at the moment because of COVID. So we've been focusing on publications, like our recent paper in Quaternary Research out this month, summarizing our excavations, stratigraphy, dating, and marine fauna. We also have a new paper that has just been accepted with minor revisions in Quaternary Science Reviews that describes our multi-proxy paleoenvironmental data. And we've also been featured in trade magazines like American Surveyor, describing topical aspects of our work. We're also using our time to focus on our public outreach and education initiatives. For example, we've started a collaboration with the award-winning science engagement and communication specialists, Jive Media Africa, to develop a worksheet about radiocarbon dating for their nationwide Science Spaza series. Science Spaza is an interactive science initiative which supports a growing network of around 150 youth science clubs throughout South Africa. Our plan is to support the creation of the first Spaza Science Club in Eastern Pondoland, and then distribute 10,000 activity worksheets through the Science Spaza Clubs Network and to junior secondary, senior secondary, and high schools in our area. We are also fundraising to develop a companion comic book that uses a locally driven narrative of female scientific empowerment, sovereignty, and community engagement to communicate basic information about archaeological science and careers in archaeology to South African primary and high school students. We've also recently built a new website for our project, seen here, that includes a blog about research activities. And the website also includes virtual tours of our study sites using spherical panorama photography that incorporates multimedia content to describe key features about the area and our research to the general public. Lastly, we've also started a web series on YouTube called Before Us. The web series focuses on the researchers who make P5 research so successful. It's a lighthearted and fun look at the personal stories and research on topics including paleoenvironments, working in remote locations, surveying, and geology, and new episodes will be out soon. There's a lot more that we have going on, but you know, time's getting short, so I'm going to conclude here for now. Before I end though, I want to thank specifically the Lambazi Amapando community, and especially their headman who has been a constant source of support and assistance to our project. Likewise, likewise I want to thank Kevin Cole and the entire East London Museum staff for their generosity and assistance, as well as numerous individuals 
throughout South Africa that have made this project possible. Thank you to each of you, thank you to our research team, and thank you to all of you for listening to this presentation tonight. Thank you. Wow, that was fantastic. Um, yeah, thanks, Eric. That, uh, that was one of the glossiest and uh, most beautiful presentations I've seen. Um, you know, that was a very nice job. Yeah, that was really excellent. Um, mm -hmm. So, yes, yeah, so <clears throat> we're going to move over to some, some questions we managed to receive from the audience. Um, so, Don, Donald jo Johansson uh, just has said hello. He joined the talk a little bit late, hey, but Don. he's going to, <laughs> to rewatch it um, later. And uh, we've got uh, Iwazi and TJ um, and Sinagugu and Halmo from Makanda. Um, so there's quite a nice uh, audience of about 60 people all watching tonight. A lot um, of friends that are that are watching, and that's 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 fantastic. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, hopefully some guys who are on your crew. So uh, looks like you had a wonderful team over there. Um, so there's a question from uh, Helmo, uh, whether there was any interaction with the Albany Museum. There has been some interaction with the Albany Museum, um, and and early on when we were. Uh, developing the infrastructure for the project, what we were trying to figure out was um, infrastructure that was going to allow us to really work in, in Pondoland, being so far away from Gramstown. Um, and and we, we talked with Celeste Booth, and we talked with uh, the folks at ECPRA, and everything, and including at the East London Museum. And what we came, the agreement that we came to was that we could develop an independent research laboratory there at the East London Museum in collaboration with all of those, those institutions. So it's not in competition with, with anyone. It's a way to potentially um, take some of the pressure off of the collections there in Grahamstown and, and the people who are um, monitoring those collections and, and gives us a space where we can work, albeit temporarily for now, you know, the collections are all still going to be acquisitioned properly at the end of the of the of their term. So so we do have a lot of interaction with Gramstown and we work with a lot of other institutions in Gramstown as well, including uh, Sanby um, and others. So we, we try and maintain as as many links as possible. Excellent. Um, so uh, a couple of other people have also just had some shout outs. So Vivian uh, Connell, uh, she's a, one of our Rock Art group members now, um, so I know her. Um, and Kim Cawthra, which I assume may be Haley's uh, pen name, um, but she's just said um, hello and very well done and excellent <laughs> presentation. And Rand Sher, um, also another name I don't recognize, but he also says wonderful, thank you. Uh, there's a question that's coming from Marina. Uh, she's asking, hi, did you find changes in fish or shell sizes? Right now, we don't have that data formalized yet to be able to, to talk about that. And, and, and the reason is, is, is simple, uh, it's, and it's due to two things. First. When we first started excavating there at Waterfall Bluff, uh, first in 2015, that we followed up with much more extensive excavations in 2016, we initially put in um, our deepest excavations right at the drip line. And that was partly because we had a better understanding of the stratigraphy at the time there. It was simpler. So we excavated uh, much deeper there initially. But what we didn't know at the time was that being right under the drip line actually had a significant influence on the shellfish in particular. Not so much the bone, uh, but the, the stratigraphy and the shellfish were being influenced by that drip water. And so it decalcified a lot of the shell. And at the, at the drip line, you find very poor quality shellfish remains as well. Um, but you also see microscopic remains. And um, our, our uh, Kat Sabo and um, uh, some of our other team members, they're looking at the microscopic shellfish particles, whereas 
Anjanetta Gerardino is looking at the macroscopic shellfish. So at that drip line, it was primarily macroscopic with, with heavily deteriorated shellfish. But as you move in, it increases, the preservation quality increases amazingly. And shellfish are found throughout. So we had a much better assemblage there at the drip line. And we are now sitting on this huge collection that we recovered in 2019 from a huge series of deposits that we've now got spectacular dates on. But soon after we brought all of those materials back, and we started to organize them and do this and that with them, everything got shut down. So we know the data are there, we see the shellfish, we see the fish, but the analyses haven't yet been done on them. Hmm. Thank, thanks, Eric. Um, so one of the, uh, there are a couple of other shout outs, I might as well mention the name as well, from Gail, uh, also just saying thank you. And she visited Waterfall Bluff in December last year. Um, and uh, it looks like an amazing site. I'm, I'm just, it's just the visuals are. I mean, uh, you have waterfalls it. and whales oh. and dolphins. I mean, you can't beat it. And amazing, wonderful people as well. Yeah, yeah, no, it really looks like quite the place to be. Um, and we've got Eugene also saying thank you, and Catherine uh, Costello. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions um, from you guys. Um, checking out any last chances, guys? Anyone? The um, I know you could probably email Eric as well if you think of something that you forgot, but... Um, okay, here on that, that last slide, we have all of our, our Facebook, our Twitter, our webpage. You can contact us through all of those. And, uh, you know, we encourage people to, to stay in touch and to communicate with us. We're, we're pretty friendly folks. Ah, we have one more question from Marjorie Robenheimer. Uh, she's asking, apart from human teeth, did you find any bones? Um, I think you did, I think you mentioned those. Well, we don't have identified right now. We don't have human bone. Ah, human uh, bones, yes. No, right. No right. We, have, we have the teeth. And, I mean, that, that's super exciting. I mean, there's amazingly few human remains in general across Africa that date to the last glacial maximum and specifically that um, come from contacts, the contexts that are reliably dated to the last glacial maximum. I mean, most of the human remains that exist right now um, were dug up, in some cases, almost 100 years ago. And, and no one really knows where they came from or really how old they date. So, so the fact that we have these remains, you know, some people may look at them and go, yeah, they're just two teeth, but that's super exciting right from the get-go. And then, of course, from the teeth alone, there's a number of different analyses that we're gonna be potentially able to do on them. Of course, working with the local communities, working with SARA, working with ECPRA, and, and other communities before we even touch them. But, you know, it would be very interesting to look at aspects of diet and look at aspects of, of mobility. You know, you, teeth grow, and uh, during the course of that, that growth interval, you can go in and you can sample each one of those different layers. And we'll be able to potentially tie that back to our isoscape, kind of track where those people were moving across the landscape, seeing if they're sitting right there at the coast or if they're going inland, up into the highlands, for example. And we're also gonna be able to look at, would, would we be able to look at their diets as well, seeing if it was a shellfish heavy diet or maybe if there were periods where there was very little uh, marine foods, I should say marine foods, not just sh shellfish, um, in, their, in their diets. And so there, there's a lot of stuff. Um, we have a couple of other places at the site that we've got our, our eyes on, um, that we're gonna be excavating especially carefully. But, but right now, those are the only two um, human remains that we have. Mm. Array, array occurrence. Um, so some more shout outs from uh, Mary uh, Edwards, also just uh, passing on her congratulations. And uh, uh, Debbie Fisher says, excellent job, Eric. Barfi Wag, I hope I pronounced that correctly, <laughs> is proud of you. That's my parents, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then Halma <laughs> is asking, when do you expect to be back on site? Uh, and then there's another question from 
uh, Sinagugu, who asks uh, whether there are any brochures or leaflets one could use or they could use to raise awareness uh, to tourists hiking the Ponderland coast about the info. Cool. So there's two so, questions there. I don't know if you want to, which one you want to take Right. On. The first one was, when do we want to get back? Mm-hmm. Yeah. As quickly as possible. I mean, we are champing at the bit right now to get back there. I mean, I'm stuck in my office, you know, doing whatever I can. Um, and I know we all are stuck, you know, with, with, with COVID. Um, right now, travel restrictions, even if we wanted to, uh, prohibit it. Our university prohibits international travel. And um, I believe South Africa still doesn't allow Americans into their country. Um, so um, we want to get there as quickly as possible. And what we're doing right now is um, we're reassessing what we can do this year within those constraints. So we have a number of team members that are located um, there in South Africa. And so we're looking at doing if, if it's going to be safe for our crew and for the people that we'd be working with to go out there and, and take care of isolated and very specific tasks. And uh, like I said, Arene is there right now. Uh, spoke with uh, Chief M. Quadini uh, just yesterday and is uh, working throughout the region and will be at uh, East London Museum thereafter. So we're, we're starting to you know, have some more momentum. It's been very quiet lately is why we've been focusing on all of the digital stuff. Uh, but the, long, uh, the short of, the, of that long answer is, is we want to be out there as, as quickly as possible. We all really enjoy being back out there. And we have so much really cool new things that we're working on, things that you know, I'm not prepared to talk to you about, but it's sitting there in our lab. It's ready to go. We've just got to get the people there to, to wrap that up. Now on to Senegugu's question about the leaflets and the tourism agencies. That's a fantastic question. And in 2019, we had a great meeting with the local tourism councils. And it's something that we really want to develop as well. Um, we've started with schools and, and developing a lot of our outreach with the schools just because um, Schools in general right now are, are struggling um, you know, with con uh, content and, and everything here in the States, in Africa, everywhere. But also because in, in our area, there's, you know, we want to we wanna really help to, to bolster some of the science education there. And, 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 and it would be just fa fantastic for us uh, if, if we can to be able to have a direct contribution back to those local communities. And so that's why we started with, with the schools, with this Science Spaza worksheet. And those worksheets are going to be distributed all throughout South Africa, but starting in our area. And then we're trying to fundraise right now. It's, it's, it's a little tricky, uh, but, but we're fundraising for um, publication of a, of a comic book and also animations that would then talk about careers and, and archaeology, and it all would be specific to um, Pondoland and, and the communities there. So we're starting with that, and we're branching out with all of our other engagement, the YouTube series and, and everything. And, and yes, we do want to do something with the tourism agencies as well. And Senegugu, let's chat about that. You know, we could put together um, some some flyers and some pamphlets and maybe write a small grant and let's let's make that happen so we're really excited about doing that we want people to come to that area and understand the significance the importance of it and not just you know marvel at how amazingly beautiful it is hmm. uh, fabulous I think you covered uh Iwazi also asked um, a similar question about the brochures, um, and he's mm -hmm. just very appreciative of the Science Spars idea um, and the essay team. And uh, we have uh, Alison House, who said that she spent a night in the shelter in 1986. Little did she know <laughs> what was there. Um, and we have uh, Catherine Costello, who's asking about um, when you get back, where would an info info center be set up at Waterfall Bluff or some sort of info board? Um, I don't know what the context is like there. 
Um, and then there's one last question. So it's just this one about the info mm -hmm. board. And then Vivian is asking about whether you are able to invite local community members to become custodians of the of the site um, and uh, you know learning about the excavation. Mm -hmm. So um, I, it does sound like you've involved a lot of local community members there. Absolutely. So, okay, so to answer uh, Catherine's question first. Hi, Catherine. Um, you know, we want to be able to come up with a plan between ourselves, ECPRA, the local communities, tourism agencies, you know, all of the, the key stakeholders in that, in that area to be able to come up with uh, an overarching plan where anyone that's coming to visit that area would be able to access information that's being generated from our project, but also if, if other people are working in those areas. And this includes not just in Lombazi, but you know, further south there on Port St. John's where you guys are at, or up north in Mkambati or Lawazi and uh, the nature reserve at, is at, or even uh, north of that in Mtentu around where Sinagugu is at. It would be nice to be able to link all of those because a lot of people, of course, hike all along that entire, um, that entire coastline. We've not yet tried to do anything like that because you know we're still relative newcomers. I mean, we've, we've been working there for almost a decade now, but still um, we, wanna, we wanna make sure that we really understand the area and have a foothold there. And that if when we start to develop all of this, it's timely and we have the time to work with each and every one of you to come up with something that, that is suitable to everyone and, and their needs. So yes, I think that would be absolutely fantastic. And um, of course, we also have to think about making it last as well. I mean, between the winds and the rain and just how remote it is as, as well. Um, we'll have to be pretty innovative about that. And that's actually one of the reasons why we developed the virtual tours at the start of, of, of our pandemic lockdown. It wasn't just because I was bored. It was because this is a way that people can digitally hike through the site or hike through the region, visit the sites and start to learn about lots of these different places, um, you know, without actually spending the time or the money to get there. So, so that's, that's, that's kind of where we stand with that. Um, and then I believe there was one other question. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah, so that was um, about involving local community members. Right, great mm -hmm. question. Yeah, so from the very beginning of the project, in fact, the very first um, meeting that I had when I went out there, when I developed P5, was meeting with local community members. Before we visited a site, uh, did any, any kind of, of activities. We met with those local community members and we've maintained that relationship ever since then. Now we're, we're, we're um, very close with the Mkambati communities and I frequently will give updates to Lawazi and, and them and, and as well as the Lombazi community with uh, Chief Mkwadini. And, and, and during our, our projects, we hire a lot of, of, of local people. And a lot of that is seasonal, but one of the things that we started in 2016, it actually began a year earlier in 2015, um, was taking some of the people from that local area, Amapondo people who have a significant interest in what we are doing and starting to train them formally in archaeological excavation and other techniques that we use every day on site. And we now have a group of, well, it's about a half a dozen people that, that we've been training um, over the last couple of years. Uh, two of them, in fact, have, have been with us now since 2015 and 2016. And they are very trusted um, and, and uh, just amazing excavators and 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 we know whenever they're working on on stuff for the project that they got that um, so we want to expand that and we want to expand our community engage engagement as well uh, not just seasonally but potentially something even bigger now I'm going to stay specifically vague about all of that right now I, 
but we have big plans. We, we don't want to be a project that comes and goes and comes and goes. We want to, we love this community, we love that area, and we want, we're gonna stay there. We want, if you wanna have us there longer, um, we, wanna, we wanna stay there and, um, and make an impact. Um, you know, for the better. And so we absolutely want to continue working with all of those communities and start to diversify out to, to communities in the, in the area. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, just from the comments and uh, the, the visuals from your presentation, I can see you're already making a very strong impact there. Um, and um, yeah, it's, I think there's lots to come by the sounds of it. So it's very exciting. Um, they, I'm just going to take one more, maybe two more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a Catherine mentioned she's going to take up um, take up this uh, or some of the ideas, I suppose, in consultation with everyone with the ICPRA or, or ECPTA. I think maybe the ICPRA or ECPTA. Maybe that's another organisation, and the PSJ Tourism Forum uh, to lead the initiative. So there's definitely people putting up their hand to help. So that's fantastic. <laughs> um, and then there's uh, one last question from Helmo, which is how close to Waterfall Bluff is the new N2 toll road? Um, mm. I have no idea. Uh, maybe you do. Yeah, it's it's close. It's not, it's not right on top of it. Um, the N2, uh, when it uh, hits Omtada, it makes its way south. And that goes to Lusiki Siki. And as far as I understand, the current um, roadway and where the bridges are all being put in, it then um, starts to travel east um, parallel with the coast just outside of, of Lusiki Siki. So that road does not come near our site. It's still a 40 minute drive from where the, the N2 actually starts to, to go north and east um, down to the to the coast and then from there once you actually get to the Lupatana mouth then it's still another 40 minute hike um, which we have to do every day with all of our gear so it's 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 still a, a long way away and and then that into again as far as I understand it uh, because I'm outside of that project is staying outside of the Mkambati reserve and and it's but it's skirting along those edges hmm. yeah uh, thank you Eric. Uh, well guys I'm gonna wrap it up there um, I don't want to keep up with talk <laughs> yeah all night um, and it's I think early morning for you, for you there in Phoenix so um, yeah thank you from from Oxac and we really appreciate it you would normally get an audience clapping like crazy and a bottle of wine <laughs> or a box of chocolates um, it'll have to wait till you back in South Africa and we can you know, give you a, a, a treat <laughs> and say our thanks. Um, but we really appreciate you being one of our speakers in this, this, uh, this virtual stream. Um, and we just wanted to wish you the best of luck for the future years in your excavations there. It's wonderful work and keep it up. Thank you very much and thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. So I'm going to end the stream and then uh, I'll just stay on with you just after that. Okay, great. Thank you. Cheers, everyone.